Next up on the Cosmic News Network, first contact with Joshua Putt. Good morning, Earthlings. Good. How you doing today? Good. Good. How you doing today? Welcome morning, to First Contact Radio. Radio. Welcome to the First Contact Radio. To talk about all these things I'm talking about is because in life, everything is energy. Every single thing that's out there. Yo, it's first contact with Joshua Bowen. He's the man on the mic, just in case you didn't know it. Covering news from all around the globe, from the weather and space to UFOs. He'll talk politics and make you open your eyes. Conspiracy theories and government lies. He'll dig it all up and try to find the proof. Cause it's time to demand the truth. It's time. First contact it's time. radio. We it's have time to demand the truth. Contact. Good morning, Earthlings. How you doing today? Welcome to First Contact Radio. Hope your day is good so far. And uh, we're going to just jump right in here. All right, today we have the 9th of the month, the 9th of April. We have a sun sign in Aries, and we have a moon sign in Leo. So we have fire, and we have more fire. Fire and fire, double fire, lots of ideas, lots of creativity. Yesterday, certainly in Los Angeles, there was lots of fire in the terms of heat, because it was hot, hot, hot. But right now, it is not, 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 because they did a wonderful job of spraying chemtrails all around the city yesterday and now it is nice and cloudy and you know all that good stuff so we see leo as our moon sign so what we've got to deal with just like yesterday is just those unconscious ideas that right useness of energy that's our subconscious mind needs to really pull together we have a trine that just happened not too long ago between right here between our moon sign Leo and this sign right here Uranus and it is change a nice good positive change unexpected change comes with with Uranus so there's something nice and positive a change taking place in our world around our ideas around the way in which we use our energy then as we move on into this evening we have a trine between our sun and our moon between Aries and Leo nice good positive vibe between those energies right there so later tonight we'll just see how those two mix together and just remember when fire and fire get together ideas and ideas sometimes they can clash because ego is getting in the way but sometimes those ideas if you take the ego out of the way there could be a nice really good flow of constructive conversation that can lead to some really great advances in different different things in life in society and so on because we're really taking that effort and using the energy to move us along with something really smooth and conducive to us Tonight, when we look up at the sky, we got the ninth right here. So, this is what we see. We've got our moon. We've got Regulus will be off to the left of the moon. So, this evening, look left to the moon about a fist width at arm's length and see Regulus and Leo. Okay. Current moon phase is 71% of the way there making our way to that full moon the Mayan Oracle we're on a five tone day five tones are called the overtones they radiate outward so imagine a dot and that dot of energy radiating outward imagine a ripple in a pond you take a stone and throw it in and it hits and it radiates outward in all directions at once. So that's the idea of the overtone. Okay, that energy is radiating outward. In this case, we have the dragon as the central kin for today. So the dragon is about birth, new beginnings, 
We have light, enlightenment, which is our hidden power. Our like-minded energy is the mirror, which is reflection. And the monkey, magic, playfulness, that is our challenge for today. So whatever seriousness takes place, we want to remember, you know, there's something else in life for us to look at, to deal at, deal with and experience. And the moon or purification is our guide for today. And all of this is the theme of synchronicity and navigation. So we're getting in synchronicity with life. That's why paying attention to what's going on with life, not the things of mankind, of humanity, but the things of a much bigger nature. What's going on in the cosmos around us. Because that's where we want to get in synchronicity. Phrase for today is I empower in order to nurture commanding being. I seal the input of birth with the overtone tone of radiance. I am guided by the power of universal water. Spaceweather.com, our solar wind is currently at 458.4 kilometers per second. Planetary K index is quiet at a 2. Here we have our coronal hole, this big one right here, making its way towards the middle of the sun. It says that between the 12th and the 14th, are the dates that we could possibly feel some effects from these coronal holes here. We'll see because those dates approach next week. Unless, of course, we start going backwards in time, then it won't be for another year, but I don't think we're going to start going backwards in time. M-class flare possibilities up to 25, X-class at 1, and geomagnetic storm activity has jumped a little bit. Um, it's 15... 20% in the higher latitudes. Numerology for today is the number 2. So let's see how we arrived at the number 2. Just like this. We've got the 4 for the month. we got the 9 for the day. we got the 7 for the year. 2014. Add them together. We have a 20. 20 is a 2 plus a 0. And then we have 2. 2 is the number where the one separates separates into two halves however those two halves which may represent masculine and feminine are part of that one because we are all a combination of energies this masculine and fem feminine energy the unconscious and conscious mind and as they are separated we need then to balance out to find out how they work together it's always easier when there's just one thing to deal with but then when you have two there's always challenges because now you have to communicate and balance just think about how it is if you're alone versus when you're with somebody else there's different benefits to both times but when you're with somebody else there's a necessary um, need I guess that's redundant necessary need it's a necessity to um, be able to communicate to be able to find a way to interact with that other that's different than when you're when you're by yourself you don't need to worry about that kind of communication but when you're with someone one else so that's the idea of the two we have to find that balance how those two are going to play together nicely and so we look over here and we see that some of the qualities are sensitive tactful diplomatic cooperative peacemakers loving they may express many musical or feminine qualities and then of course we have the negative sides of that which are discontent, spoiled, lazy, particularly the truth. It's associated with the moon and the tarot card of the high priestess. This is the card of the high priestess right here. It's all about tapping into our spirituality going into that inner temple. Okay, when you look at the tree of life, the symbol, I don't have it right in front of me here, but tree of life symbol is this represents that middle path which is going straight down the center and you access this inner temple by our imagination use our imagination to enter in and as we enter into the inner inner temple that inner chamber we find this is a place a secret place within each one of us that we go to it's a sacred place that we go to to find out what that pureness within ourselves is that we might be able to bring it forth learn the lessons of what this is all about all right and on the Jewish calendar you can see that today we are at a 
9 Nissan is the name of today. Moving on forward here. We're now less than a week away from Passover and there's quite a few events taking place as we get closer to that day with the planets and the stars. I'm going to be talking about those in just a little bit. That gets us kick started for today. Let's jump over to UFO News because it's up next. This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk. Thank you very much. First UFO News story starts today. This is over Ireland, Cork, Ireland. This was footage that came in from the 29th of March over Cork Island. It says, reflecting the sun, the saucer spins up down twice before stopping and reflecting its whole body above the treetops. The footage was very short as the phone was touched without knowing the camera was disabled. It looked like a, shi it looked like a shining spinny cloth in the air. There we have it right there. Pretty interesting just the way it's moving and spinning and see it back there in the distance, this white thing. So very interesting indeed. Alright, just kind of moves along smoothly. Let's move from there to our next one. This takes us over at Cape Town. A witness in Cape Town, South Africa, still looking for an explanation for a rounded dome shape that appears in the upper left corner of the frame. The reporting witness filed a report for her boyfriend who said she is not entirely convinced that it's a plane or helicopter. It was taken in Cape Town, South, Al South Africa on Saturday, March 2nd. The photo woman stated that she was taking photographs of the general scenery with a friend and only noticed the shape of the left-hand side of the image above the cloud. There's definitely no planes or helicopters in the area. This part of Cape Town is where the mountains near the Simonstown Naval Base, which allegedly has secret underground bunkers, and it's somewhat of a hub for UFO reports increasing in recent years. It is a quiet, semi-wild residential area which overlooks the sea. First photograph is a dark blue square superimposed over the object, which is visibly dull, metallic looking, and rounded in order to highlight its position in the image. The second photo is the first shot, sharpened and zoomed, no other magn Manipulation has been done to the photographs. It's very clear. It's a rounded dome shape at the top with a flatter bottom. No wings or tail fins or helicopter blades are visible. All right. There's an image right there. Moving forward, we go to favorite volcano, Popocatepetl. Black cigar UFO over a volcano in Mexico, April 7th. Again, we have a couple of live cams. You can check it out yourself. These two UFOs were seen on a live cam, slowly moving over the mount of the volcano. The 29 minutes of footage is mind-blowing. There are two live cams that I know of, and I will include their links above. The mouth of the volcano is about 600 meters across and 25 kilometers at the volcano base. So that would make these UFOs about 40 to 50 meters long. This volcano is famous for its UFO entering and exiting the area and is well known to UFO researchers as an alien base exists four to six kilometers below. I myself did look at the cam yesterday but didn't get lucky. So it's a hit or miss but look at that it just pointed right there and here's our objects. And a little video of it here this is a 29 just shy of 30 minutes. There we go, right there. Let's see, they actually, if this is that one right there, it actually is. Uh, it looks like it's on there, but it's in front of it. I'm guessing. There it is up in the sky. So as you can see, there's some interesting footage here definitely to check out, see what's going on with it, but definitely something is happening out there 
at this volcano. Now we move there to our next story. This is about the beacon on Mars. You heard that story. We talked about it the other day. Here it is. Just to refresh your memory. The picture was taken and there was a light source there in the distance. All right. Now I know that you see this with your eyes and I know that you understand when you see things with your eyes what they mean. However, sometimes it takes sometimes it seems to require agencies on earth to tell us what we actually saw with our eyes before we truly understand. And this is certainly the case here because the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, well, they explained what happened. And see, if they're telling us, it must be real, right? Bright spots appear in a single image is taken by the navigation camera on NASA's Curiosity Mars rover on April 2nd, April 3rd. Each is an image taken by the stereo camera's right eye camera, but not an image is taken within a second of each other by those left eye camera. In the two right eye, right eye images, the spot is in different locations of the image frame, and in both cases at the ground surface level in front of the crater rim on the horizon. One possibility is that the light is the light from a rock surface reflecting from the sun. When these images were taken each day, the sun was in the same position as the bright spot west-northwest from the rover and relatively low in the sky. The rover science team is also looking at the possibility that the bright spots could be sunlight reaching the camera CCD directly through a vent hole in the camera's housing, which has happened previously on other cameras on Curiosity and other Mars rovers when the geometry of the incoming sunlight relative to the camera is perfectly precisely aligned. We think it's either a vent hole, leak, or a glinty rock. Well, whew, thank goodness. They cleared that up, didn't they? In other words, it's just another case of move along, folks. Nothing to see here. Because you know, when NASA and Jet Propulsion Laboratory decide to jump into a discussion of what's going on, you know that you're on to something, right? Because they're not vested in, they're vet in telling you the truth, telling us the truth. Because if they were, we'd certainly know a lot more. So it's quite fascinating how they pop up right away just because so many people have questioned about what this is. And uh, just another one of those silly moments of you don't really see what you see. You see what we tell you to see, which is quite funny in itself that uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a lab named after Jack Parsons, put this lab together, who was a disciple of Aleister Crowley, um, is now a pinnacle for truth in this field. A little bit funny, at least I think so, ha ha. But uh, we're going to move on from there. So for those who are watching and paying attention like I know you are, we know what's going on. We know that they're just trying to do another cover-up because... They don't think us silly humans could really uh, deal with the fact that there might be life out there, even though that we know that there was and is at this point in time. Just another example of what's going on that we're not supposed to know about, but we do. So much, we, you know, NASA, JPL, we know what's going on. We can see we have our eyes, so we appreciate your explanation. But we understand. We understand. All right, moving on. This is a new book, Churns Up Mysteries of the 1947 UFO Frenzy. August 1st, 1947, an Army B-25 bomber crashed in the Rose Valley, killing two of the four men aboard. That's one subject in a new book, the Maury Island UFO incident that can be verified as factual. However, many of the incidents discussed in the book are unsolved mysteries, if not outright fabrications. Reported sightings of UFOs over Mount Rainier and what is now known as Vashon Island in Puget Sound in the month before the plane crash. A visit by a man in black to someone who witnessed the UFO spewing metallic slag. The early death of the hard-hitting newspaper man who asked the Army tough questions about the UFOs and the plane crash. A key figure who claimed to have seen the UFOs and also 
spotted on the grassy knoll in Dallas, from which some people insist shots were fired at President John F. Kennedy. Yes, conspiracy theories fly throughout the Maury Island incident faster than an alien spacecraft over Roswell, New Mexico. This book by Charles Lafevre and Phil Lipson in the North West Museum of Legends in Lawrence, Seattle is a haphazard collection of reprints of newspaper and magazine articles and biographies of key players. Despite the book's disorganization, the Maury Island incident makes for entertaining, if not always believable, reading. The authors visited Kelso in 2007 and 2008 to see the B-25 crash site and interview someone who visited in 1947. James Gerrard, who lives near the crash site, donated a piece of the crashed airplane to the Cowitz Museum, County Historical Museum. Though pieces of the B-25 still litter the woods along Gobble Creek, most of the mystery took place in the Tacoma area. According to the book, on June 21, 1947, Harold Dahl and three other people were flying their boat off Maury Island, now called Vashon Island, and they reported seeing six flying saucers dumping hot black lava-like rocks in the water and land. Dahl told the supervisor of his private beach home security company, Fred Crisman. The next day, a man in black came to visit Dahl and told him to keep quiet if he loved his family. Two days later, Kenneth Arnold, the pilot who ran a fire equipment business, took off from Chiales and reported spotting nine UFOs tooling along at more than 1,000 miles per hour between Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. On July 5th of that year, the crew of the United Airlines DC-3 also reported nine flying discs near Mount Rainier. The media picked up the stories, which resulted in even more sightings of things that appear to have come from outer space. All right, a lot more to this article here. Again, men in black jump up. Move along, folks. Nothing to see here. But I think this day and age, people are definitely getting smarter. At least they're kind of on to the to the game that's going on, right? Something is seen, something is experienced, and then a, an agency pops up right away to tell you, oh, no, no, it's not that. So we understand. It's just part of the game. Part of the game, I think if we just laugh at it, kind of makes it uh, a little bit lighter. Because we know what's going on. We understand. This is not for the benefit of those who are paying attention. It's for the benefit of those who aren't paying attention. Because they're very easily dissuaded. Very easy to tell somebody, oh no, you didn't see that. Throw it on the mainstream news networks. They broadcast it several times. And there you have it. Cover up continued. But when people are smarter, when people are using their minds and, and engaged in a process of critical thinking, guess what? That kind of programming does not work. And people are able to see through what's going on. And I think more and more of us are seeing through what's going on, which is why these events happen as far as the cover-ups go. Because it is known that more people are catching on. I think it's we're, it's a good sign too, isn't it? To see that as soon as someone, the powers that be, jump up to try to discredit something, you know that you're on to the truth. And these day and age, it's happening quite often. An incident happens and instantly a cover-up takes place. It's, uh, it seems to be that there is a real uh, panic taking place from the powers that be who know that their time is short. And so they want to keep everything hushed-hush so that hopefully people will forget about it go back to sleep and then they can continue to gain more power but those days are over those days are over we're now moving to times of truth and those moments of them having complete control well they're long gone we just are creating a new world new dimensions we're shifting and you know let them stay on their planet of lies maybe there could be all of the planet of lies and then all of those who want to move will move to the dimension of truth it could be that that easy, you know. Wouldn't imagine the world. Imagine that. Imagine if, as things split, you got the one planet, Earth, the dimension of Earth, and you got all those who are believing in the truth. And just imagine all those people that just lie and cover ups. Imagine them all being part of this other Earth. And imagine where they're going to have to go to. It would truly be a hell situation, wouldn't it? We lived in the world this day and there wasn't that continual back and forth of truth and, and lies that kind of keep everything going within there. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Anyway, that's our UFO news for today. I'll be right back.
Come into our circle, great spirit. Fill our souls with peace. So we have some events taking place up in the sky over the course of this next week and things that you should know about because they are definitely affecting us down here. Total lunar eclipse will darken the moon next week. Okay. Stargazers and lunar fans in the western hemisphere will have the ringside seats for a total eclipse of the moon during the overnight hours April 14th and 15th. The spectacular, the spectacle of celestial shadows will be the first of two total lunar eclipses in 2014 that will be visible, visible from North America. Unlike an eclipse of the sun, an eclipse of the moon presents no hazards to the viewer. No precautions to protect the eyes are needed. For the Western Hemisphere, the eclipse will officially begin on April 15, 12.53 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time when the moon begins to enter the Earth's outer or penumbral shadow. But even in clear weather, sky watchers will not notice any changes in the moon's appearance until about 50 minutes later, when a slight smudge of shading starts becoming evident on the left portion of the moon's disk. The first definitive changes in the moon's appearance will come on its upper left edge. At 1.58 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the partial phase of the eclipse will begin as the Earth's dark shadows called the umbra starts to slowly creep over the face of the full moon. At 3.06 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the eclipse will reach totality, but sunlight bent by our atmosphere around the curvature of the Earth should produce a coppery glow on the moon. At this time, the moon, if viewed with binoculars or a small telescope, will present the illusion of seemingly glowing from within by its own light. At 3.46 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the Earth and the Moon will be almost exactly in line, and the light of the Moon will appear at its dimmest. Totality ends at 4.24 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and the Moon will completely emerge from the umbra at 12, at 5.33 a.m., about 20 minutes later. The last vestige of the far, fainter penumbral shadows will disappear from the Moon's upper right, and the body will return to its normal brilliance. The entire 78 minutes of total eclipse will be visible from all North and South America. Totality will also be visible in its entirety from New Zealand and Hawaii. In all, an estimated 922 million people will have an opportunity to enjoy the best part of the lunar show from start to finish. In other parts of the world, only the partial stages of the eclipse will be visible. Moonrise or moonset will intervene during the total phase of the eclipse that will occur during daytime and the moon is not above the local horizon. Portions of the westernmost Africa can catch the opening stages of the eclipse before the moon sets below the horizon during the morning hours of April 15th. A slice of eastern Asia and all of the land down under, except western Australia, meanwhile, can catch the closing stages just after the moon rise on the evening of April 15th. Generally speaking, more than one billion people will be able to view at least part of this eclipse but because Europe and most of Asia will be tuned away from the moon and will be in the daylight during the eclipse, the majority of the world's population will miss out on the shady celestial drama. All right, there's a lot more to this. You can go ahead and read through. We certainly will all see this next week. Be curious to see what is done in the sky because when we have different events that are taking place, chemtrails seem to pop up. You've seen them in the skies around you. Out in Los Angeles, they were pretty heavy yesterday. And last night, there was an alignment. I'm going to tell you about this alignment that took place. 
When you're looking at the sky, you notice that Mars has been pretty bright. Well, Mars and the Earth and the Sun have all been in did an alignment last night. Part of you know this upcoming series of alignments that are taking place. It's alignment that happens about every 26 years, so it's not completely rare, but it is quite fascinating that it's happening now in accordance with all of these other alignments which are taking place and all these are great signs in the sky for us to take notice of so we'll see we'll be able to uh, we'll see come next week what they do in the skies around us hopefully things will be clear we'll think clear thoughts and perhaps we'll uh, we'll get there Rise of the Blood Moons, rare alignments of Mars, Earth, and the Sun associated with major religious events to begin this week. If you spotted an orange, if you spotted an orange colored star on Sunday, Tuesday night, then you were probably looking at Mars. In fact, the event you witnessed was rare for the first time in 778 days. Earth, Mars, and the Sun aligned in opposition with the planets. To scientists, this is ultimately meaningless arrangement, but to a Christian minority, it marks the beginning of significant events, even the second coming of Christ. The significance of the alignment is that it happened exactly a week before the first of four dark blood-red moons, which some Christians believe mark a cycle associated with the end of the world. John Hagee, a Christian pastor who has written a book on a tetrad called Four Blood Moons, Something is About to Change, told the Daily Express that Tuesday night marked the dawn of a hugely significant event for the world. This is not something that some religions think tanks put together, the notoriously outspoken church founder said. NASA has confirmed that the tetra has only happened three times in more than 500 years, and that is going to happen now. Also known as a tetrad since it involves four successive total blood red moon eclipses followed by six blood moons. NASA has confirmed to start a Tuesday night and will end September 28th. In the 21st December century, tetrads are a frequent occurrence with nine sets in total, but this has not always been the case. From 1600 to 1900, for example, there were none at all. The book of Joel and the King James Bible prophesied about the blood moons and the end of the world. The moon shall be turned to darkness, the moon turned to blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord comes. According to Mr. Hagee, each time the tetrad has happened during this time, there has been a significant religious event accompanied with it. In 1943, the first tetrad saw the expulsion of the Jews by the Catholic Spanish Inquisition. The second happened in 1949, right after the State of Israel was founded, and the most recent one in 67 happened during the Six-Day War between Arabs and Israelis. And Mr. Hagee said the first blood moons will happen on April 15th, right in the middle of the Jewish holiday of Passover. The second, October 8th, during the Feast of the Tabernacle. The third, April 4th, 2015, during Passover. And the final one happens the 28th, of 2015 during the Feast of the Tabernacles. Okay? So, that's what's coming up. My question, I'm just curious thing, but tetrad, doesn't tetrad usually come from three? So if we have four events going on, four blood moons, wouldn't that be a quatrad? Four? So I'm not quite certain why it's considered a tetrad as opposed to a quatrad, but what do I know, right? Okay. Maybe uh, maybe you can explain that to me. This one here is another bit on the same thing. Divine sign for Israel. Hagee explains the blood moons. The book of Genesis says God uses the sun, the moon, and the stars for signs and seasons. Examples can be found throughout the Bible. Think of how a star led the wise men to Jesus, or how the still Sun stood still as Joshua led Israel to the victory over his enemies. According to Pastor John Hagee, God is getting ready to speak this way once again. There's a sense in the world that things are changing and God is trying to communicate with us in a supernatural way. I believe that these next two years are going to be see something dramatic happen in the Middle East involving Israel that will change the course of history in the Middle East and impact the whole world, he predicted. In his book, Four Blood Moons, Something is About to Change, Hagee lays out what he calls celestial signals. 
He describes how a series of blood moons in 2014 and 2015 will have a great significance for Israel. Although single blood moons happen fairly regularly, four appearing so closely together are extremely rare. There have only been a series of blood moons a handful of times over the past 500 years. So what exactly is a blood moon and what is the biblical significance? A blood moon is when the earth comes between the sun and the moon, Hagee explains, and the sun is shining through the atmosphere of the earth. Cast upon the moon a red shadow, and so the moon appears to be red. Such moons appear several times in scripture. In the book of Joel, God said, There will be wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In Acts, the apostle Peter repeats the verse from Joel, that the book of Revelation says that during the great tribulation the moon will become like blood. Blood moons are said to appear on April 2014 on Passover, and then again 2014 September during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is also called Sukkot. The timing of the same for 2015, a total of four blood moons at all appearing on Jewish feast days. The sun, the moon, and the earth are controlled by God Almighty, Haig said. He is one getting them in direct alignment on certain days at a certain time, but each time it's a Passover or a Sukkot. Here is the past, and in the past the rare appearances of the four blood moons and these feast days had coincide, coincided with major events for Israel and the Jewish people. In 1942, Spain expelled the Jews. Columbus also discovered America, which became a safe haven for the Jewish people. In each of these blood moons, you have something that begins in tragedy and ends in triumph. For instance, in 1948, Israel was born, reborn as a nation. After 200 years, God supernaturally brought them from 66 nations to a nation born in that day, Hagee noted. That again was a supernatural holocaust, something that happened following the tragedy of the Holocaust. In 1967, Israel won the Six-Day War and recaptured Jerusalem. For the first time in 2,000 years, Jerusalem was a state of, and the state of Israel were together again. The blood moons of 2014 and 15 are poised to appear as Iran works toward nuclear weapons in Israel's neighbors. Egypt and Syria are in chaos. The only reason that Iran will not acquire a nuclear bomb will be that the Israelites chose a military solution to that crisis. I believe if that happens, it will start a series of events that will then change the course of the world, he said. If Israel does not, then it will still change the course of world history. Hege has been warning about the Iranian crisis nuclear threat throughout his week. With Christians United for Israel, which he founded in 2006, it is now the largest pro-Israel organization in America with some 1.3 million members. All right, so one of the things that comes to mind as I read through this right here, let me go to this section right here. It says, in the past, these appearances of the moon on the feast days coincided with major events. Well, 1492, Spain expelled the Jews, Columbus discovered America. But for those of us who have really been involved studying and seeing what happened in history, we know that Columbus wasn't the one who discovered America. It's what the history books tell us. So, is it possible that humans took those dates, looked at them in the sky, and said, you know, this Bible tells us that God's going to do things on these dates. Let's manipulate things a little bit. Let's tell people this happened on this date, and maybe that's part of it. You know, I think there's a number of incidences that go on where manipulation is certainly at hand. All right, something just to consider. We'll see what happens as those dates come about. All right, I'm going to move on now to Damon Hur. Hidden in the heart of a mountain in northern Italy is a magical construction, a modern cathedral that's been called the eighth wonder of the world. called Damen Hur, Temples of Humankind. So every year thousands of people from all over the world visit this large contemporary cathedral. Many use it as a tool for personal research and to open within themselves new paths to inspiration and creativity. The temples can be visited every day. They are available for individual or group meditation to celebrate life's milestones such as a wedding or welcome even a newborn child. 
ceremonies and initiations of all spiritual schools of the world are welcome for those who love art and architecture and are looking for a new frontier for the human ingenuity and creativity for those who want to discover And then we talk, so they have all these various halls, the Hall of Mirrors. Hall of Mirrors is dedicated to light, air, sky, sun, and spirituality. The temple celebrates and prepares for the complete reawakening of humanity. The light comes from above, shining through a precious cupola in Tiffany glass. The dominant shade is the yellow of the sun, and the other colors of the rainbow are also present. The light that illuminates from within gives the impression that there is an open sky above. Because of the skillful play of reflection on the surface of the mirrors, the luminosity diffuses throughout the entire space. The Hall of Water, dedicated to the feminine principle and the fem female divine forces, this hall has the shape of a chalice, a symbol of receptivity and welcoming. In the Hall of Water, blue light diffuses through the Tiffany glass cupola above, giving the sensation of being immersed in an underwater atmosphere. Metaphysical diagrams. Selfic schedules and ancestral symbols are painted on the rounded walls of the Hall of Water. The Hall is a vast library which serves to reawaken profound memories for all who enter it. Hall of Earth. The Hall of Earth, 30 meters underground, is composed of two circular rooms that create an infinity sign. The temple celebrates our planet, nature, and the masculine principle, which is active and fertile. The upper room, over the seven meters high, Host the magnificent sun door and the colors of the sun. Opposite it stands the moon door in a thousand shades of blue, sky, and silver. Hall of Metals. The circular temple is dedicated to the metals and to time. Eight precious glass windows represent eight faces, complemented by symbols from the Dom Dom Dominurian sacred language, as well as information about the metals and the landscapes. This symbolically resents human life stages, the progression from the youngest age, connected to iron to the oldest one, connected with gold, symbolizes human existence as a journey of spiritual refinement. And the hollow spheres symbolically represents the heart of the temples. Here, refined energies are the subtle, telluric, and divine flow through the temples. And the labyrinth. The vast hall is dedicated to union and harmony of all divine forces of our planet. Walking along the labyrinth is like walking through the entire history of humanity, distilling the divine principle from within oneself, connecting the eternal essence beyond all cultural representations. And the Blue Temple. The Blue Temple is the oldest hall and has been dedicated to the birth of the temples. The Blue Temple was built exclusively with hammers and chisels. The female figure in the mosaic at the center of the floor represents the star, a card from the tarot that symbolizes practical idealism and beauty, which are two themes inspired, that inspired the construction of the temples. In a carefully made mosaic, there's a hidden trap door that descends to a, and forms a staircase when it opens. All right, so there you go. You can take a virtual tour of the place. That is Damon here. I have another site here about that place. This is Damonhur.org. It's a federation of spiritual communities located in Italy, north of Piedmont, between Turin and Aosta, in a radius of 15 kilometers that includes in the center an area named Valchulusia, a valley that is still green and clean. 600 citizens of Damanhur living there have given rise to the multilingual society open to exchanges with the world and to different cultures and people. Damanhur was founded in 1975 under the inspiration of Falco Hawk Oberto Arati. His enlightened and pragmatic vision created a fertile reality based on solidarity, sharing love and respect for the environment so as to obtain recognition in 2005 as the model for s of substance society of the global human settlements. Great construction may be called the eighth wonder of the world. So there you go. So there's a lot of information about this here, so you can check it out. Check it out. Check it out. See what it's about. The reason I want, wanted to bring this up, talk about this a little bit, it's a fascinating community. 
at this moment, Trisha McCann, and she's been on the show a number of times, a uh, friend to the show. She's out there with a group. So when she gets back, I'm going to be in touch with her and talk to her about her experience, and we'll have her on the show talking about what she what she uh, did over there and what they experienced and all that good stuff. All right? All right. Let us move along. So this one here has to do with ginger. Ginger as in the herb. Let me show you this. Ten healing benefits of ginger. Ayurveda gives ginger the status of the virtual medicine chest. That's because this wonder spice has been time-tested, digestion-friendly properties. In addition to its numerous other health benefits, in India, ginger is liberally used in daily life. Ginger-infused chai is a household favorite, and it's grandma's antidote of choice for battling the cold and the flu. On millions of dining tables in India, you'll see matchsticks of fresh ginger that have turned a soft pink from being soaked in lemon juice and salt, a zingy accompaniment to any meal. So here's uh, 10 good benefits. Haven't been feeling hungry? Eat fresh ginger just before lunch to stoke a dull appetite and fire up the digestive juices. Ginger improves the absorption and assimilation of essential nutrients in the body. Ginger clears the microcirculatory channels of the body, including the pesky sinuses that tend to flare up from time to time. Feeling air sick or nauseous? Chew on ginger, preferably tossed in a little honey. Can't stop a tutathon? Gas. Oops, guess what? Ginger helps reduce flatulence. Tummy moaning and groaning under cramps? Munch on ginger. Reeling under joint pain? Ginger, which has anti inflammatory properties, can bring relief. Float some ginger essential oil in your bath to help aching muscles and joints. Just had surgery? Chewing ginger root post operation can help overcome nausea. Stir up some ginger and tea to get rid of throat and nose congestion. And when there's a nip in the air, the warming benefits of the tasty tea are even greater. And 10, bedroom blues, try adding gingery pouch to a bowl of soup. All right. And then here's a couple of ways in which you can use ginger. Ginger and herb rice, ginger in your juice, gingery dessert. Ginger's really good, good stuff. Every day I have a, a slice of it when I wake up. I just take the ginger root, just cut it off, peel off the, the skin of it. That's it, eat it. It has a bitter taste, and so that's why honey. you have some honey with it. I've gotten used to it just as is, so I just have it fresh, plain, no honey, and uh, I like it. I think it's a, a, good, a good substitute for coffee. Because I find that when I have it, I'm able to, to wake up in a, a different way. You don't feel all that jitteriness that you do when you have the caffeine. So give it a try if you haven't tried it. It's really, as you heard there, it has some great healing properties. And I think you'll find it to be very beneficial to you and to your health. All right, uh, article here about community living. Community living, something that used to be done a lot more and perhaps will be done again. Michelle Welling. In the late 60s and early 70s, hippie communes and campgrounds were a place of peace and love. Government camping regulations now disallow this kind of living on public lands. Communal living is discouraged from society to the point of zoning and utility restrictions that define usage of public and private property. People are now taking a stance against government restriction and are realizing that they were created to live together in communities where we are all equal and we all have something to contribute as we should not have to pay extra for the things like water, energy, and organic food. Many people over the last 40 plus years have had the dreams of buying property and creating a low-cost living miniature city that is self-sufficient. Everyone would have everything they needed to live comfortably and barter or donation would get you anything you needed. Of one person, if one person liked to cook, they could cook for many, and another person liked to build houses, they would build houses for many. Children are meant to grow up with just one or two caregivers. In a communal living, children have many surrogate mothers and father figures with aunts, uncles, and neighbors. Children need to be surrounded by loving people in their formative years and are to be shown how to live in love. Instead, most children today live in broken homes with parents that argue about money and other societal difficulties. 
The Amish grow their own organic food and have the lowest rates of cancer and disease. In correlation, they do not vaccinate their children. They also have most of what they need right there in their community where everyone grows up learning a trade. However, the Amish still do not have the idea 100% correct or we already have been living or we already have been living like them and the world would be a different place. This means there still may be some free will lacking in decision making which still allows for control. However, many principles used by the Amish can parallel to substantiable communities without the societal restrictions. There's a lot to this article. I'm going to go to the end here. Here's uh, where are we at here? See, it's a long article. I told you, got a couple of good videos there. There we go. It says until we are on a fifth dimensional frequency or higher vibration, when we do things like raise money for others and exchanging items on the basis of what we think it is worth. This creates a tem template in human consciousness for other people to tap into it, and so on and so on. This is one way to change the world, the future of community living that involves human humanitarian practices and technology that will simplify living and allow everyone to do what they enjoy every day. Do not ever underestimate the power of one small act. Pay attention to the large acts that are selling models for humanity to follow. Build bridges now for humanity to cross, as the saying goes, build it and they will come so there you go it's a good article all about communal living I mean we certainly know and have heard about it plenty Native Americans that weren't they living communally on the reservations you know, even though that they were put there by governments but you know they're living communally before when uh, anyone came and started bothering them they were certainly living in peace and there was this real community amongst them and we've heard lots about the idea. It seems to be a, an example of how humanity is getting back to its roots. We think of the Essene community and some of the other communities that lived throughout history. The way the world's going, you know, it's, it's necessary to consider other possibilities and opportunities than what is being presented by some of these world governments. Because they're not really caring too much about the people. They seem to be more interested in money, corporate power, and all that other nonsense. But people are wising up, and that's a good thing. The more we wise up, the more we'll go back to a way that's going to take care of ourselves. Because ultimately what we need to do is we need to go inside, us. And when we go inside, we find what we need is there. We don't have to look outside. And once we find what we need is in here, and we share it with others, it changes the way in which we experience things. And that seems to be what communal living does. It's a sharing. It's people getting together. And, you know, I know some people who live in that type of way, and they're extremely happy because it frees up what, as they say, it frees up what they are doing in life. They're not engaged in some of the, the madness that the world is offering. They're together, and they're more peaceful and harmonious and, you know, sharing. And that's a good example for the world. So, article's there. It's a good article. Check it out. And let's get over to our message for today. This is from Hilarion. Hilarion. April 6th to 13th, 2014, by Marlene Sweat Lashaw. Beloved ones, it is important for each of you to maintain your centeredness and calmness each day. The energies as they move in waves upon the planet bring changes in every facet of human life. As the increased light flows outward, it ignites awakening in many other souls and as you know, awakening is quite often a painful process that requires the assimilation of many truths that were not recognized or even thought of before. You have already experienced this process and can relate to the profound effects that these revelations create within the newly awakened ones and their desire to facilitate powerful changes in their world. They are eager to make a difference and they are willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. This is why your stabilizing energies are so needed during these times. Send light to those areas of the world which are experiencing upheaval and destabilization. Do this whenever you hear of it, just taking a moment to send light gives assistance in more ways than you know. All you need is intention and during this process, ask the angels of light to go to these places and heal the area, the land, the animals, the elemental beings, 
and send light to assist all the people who live there. You are the ones who are aware and must exercise your power by calling on the angels for assistance and directing them to the areas where they are needed. Begin to observe the information communicated through the news media in a different way, not as passive observers but as enlightened beings who can take note of where the light is needed and direct it there immediately. Your input on a daily basis as you assign the angels and helpers to chaotic areas of the world helps to stabilize those areas. It only requires that you focus and call upon the forces of light to direct them to those areas. Understand that each of you has an army of light at your command and you can make a difference by sending these forces into volatile areas of the world when they are needed. Your intention to affect the highest outcomes, wherever your focus is directed will bring harmony, and your attention to this focus with dedication each day will create the lasting peace you so desire to experience on your world. Send light to the natural kingdoms as they are an integral part of life upon this planet. Send light to everything upon your planet and do not forget to surround your loved ones, family members and pets with white light each and every day, surround your home, properties, vehicles, places of occupation, bank accounts and daily activities with the white light of protection each and every day. You are the awakened ones and you are responsible for the area in your sphere on influence which can be many miles in diameter. Intend that this sphere of influence grows in radius each and every day so that a greater area is covered by your efforts. Intention is everything and you can do this. Be an open door for God's light to be manifest in and through you. Maintain a vision of something better always, such as one great planet under God. Throughout this year stay in your spiritual consciousness and know that your spirituality is what defines you. Do a weekly review to make improvements in your life so that your spiritual growth continues. Have you balanced all your karma, have you fulfilled all your soul contracts? Did you pass all your tests and initiations? Are your initiations completed? This lifetime is your last lifetime upon earth because this opportunity to experience life in a physical body on a planet of duality will not happen again and it is incumbent upon you to ensure that you complete everything your soul plan intended to complete. In any sticky situation or issue that comes up, ask yourself, what am I teaching myself here? What is the highest outcome that can manifest here in this situation and what can I do to make it happen? Go beyond your human ego promptings and look at your life from the higher perspective. Do you want to create divisions in relationships that could be healed by overlooking the perceived transgressions of others? Will you let ego pride take control and create separations? Know that love is the answer in every situation and use this power in every facet of your existence and relationships with others. The bottom line is how much do you love? Learn to love with the love of God who loves us all unconditionally with no judgment. Become the enlightened being that can rise above any situation and see a more loving perspective. Surrender and release all that no longer serves the path that you have chosen to walk resistance to the enlightened being that you really are is futile. Look for the good in all things. Fill your heart with the flame of love and let that flame grow and expand out into the world around you. Be the change. The game has changed. Dear ones, no longer can you sit on the fence reluctant to make a clear choice. The time is now to move into the light of higher consciousness with constancy in your heart. It must be done in every cell of your being. You are worthy of great things, know that everything will work out and things will get better. You are blessed in more ways than you can imagine. The universe supports you, all of life supports you and this is becoming more evident with each passing hour. You are a child of the divine and your magnificent future awaits your attention and your intention. Be here now. Until next week. I am Hyla Ryan. Alright, nice message from Hyla Ryan. Let's move on to our meditation for today. So close your eyes, take a deep breath. And exhale. Take another deep breath. And exhale again. So imagine all of our chakras are activated starting from the bottom of the spine upward red at the bottom of the spine drawing the energy from the earth above that at the belly button orange moving up there just below the rib cage imagine the color yellow at that chakra then they move up into the heart space and at the heart chakra imagine the color green 
From the heart chakra, the energy moves up to the throat. Imagine the color blue. From the throat chakra, the energy moves up higher yet to between the two eyes, right between the eyebrows, to the third eye. Imagine the color indigo. And finally, crown chakra, the top of the head. Imagine the color violet. And then the light continues on, connecting into the cosmos as it turns bright white. And feel this energy flowing through you. See the multicoloredness of it. Feel the wisdom and the information that presents itself through of this energy, through this light. Now imagine that light as it fills your body, overflowing. And as this energy overflows and spills out into the room you're in, and imagine this light going out. It's a light of protection. Light of love. And it goes out around the room. And just imagine fortifying your room and the space where you live with this protective, loving energy. And see this energy moving out yet further into the city where you live. And imagine the people that you know, your friends, your family, Surround them with this protective light, this protective love. And see this energy move out further across the entire continent where you live. Again, imagine those people close to you, your family, your friends, and imagine this light being around them, protecting and loving. And then see this light move across the continent, across the oceans, to the other continents around the world. And send this protecting, loving light down into the planet. Up into the cosmos. And just imagine around the world, friends and family are all protected in this light. This love. And as this earth absorbs the light that is being sent down to it, the earth vibrates back peacefully and lovingly as well. And we feel the earth smiling. And we send this energy up into the cosmos. And the space brothers and space sisters, they feel this loving energy coming from earth. And they smile because they know that we are moving along in the way that we should be moving along. And as you consider the world and consider the events taking place on a daily basis, take a moment and just realize that there are many different ideas and thoughts. There are dimensions which are pulling apart and separating. There are earths which are created in multiple dimensions. And as you recall the story of the Bible, the separating of the wheat from the chaff, Know, too, that there is a separation of the good and the bad. Let those things which no longer serve you fall away. Imagine all of those who are out there spreading disinformation. We know who they are and just send love to them. Love that they might understand what they are doing through their disinformation campaigns, that they might change their ways. Open their hearts. And let's just imagine this world as a place of light, love, happiness, perfection. And as we go through the world today, let's just think a good thought for those that we meet and see. Let's continue to look for the good in others, regardless of who they are. And just understand that if we look for this good, we shall find this good and bring it forth. For all are God's children. Contemplate this affirmation 
I find myself growing in wisdom, courage, and good health, and responding to others with compassion. I find myself growing in wisdom, courage, and good health, and responding to others with compassion. And know that as we think of others, in turn, that energy comes right back to us. And we find that as we reach out to help others in the world, we are helping ourselves equally. We know it to be a win-win situation. And it helps us to understand that we are all caretakers caretakers of each other so let's just now let our conscious mind continue on this journey of finding the good in all and let's bring our conscious memory back to the present moment as well continuing to look for the good in all things to look for the God in all things and let's bring our conscious mind back to this waking moment on the count of three three coming back to the present moment filled with confidence two coming back to the present moment filled with faith and one coming back to the present moment happy healthy and whole happy healthy and whole take another deep breath exhale and go ahead and open your eyes that's it, my friends. That's our show for today. Thank you very much for being here. I'll be back tomorrow with more news and information. And like yesterday, let's just go out and let's just look for the good in others. I know that there's a lot of challenges in this because there's a lot of crazy things that go on. But let's be the leaders. by looking for the good and finding a way to bring that forward. Because if we bring forth the good, world's going to be a much better place and that's what we all truly desire even those who are out there trying to control things there's good in them and they are simply trying to make their world a better place they're just doing it from a selfish standpoint so let's just send them the love that they change as well thanks for being here I'll be back tomorrow with more news and information have an awesome day I'll talk to you soon peace I'm out of here